We're RP Group 115, and we reverse engineered a uh, six volt DC motor. I'm Paul. I'm Chris. I'm Jesse. We hope you enjoy our project. You might think that the transformation of electrical energy into mechanical power would be a complicated process, but really it's not. When we took apart our motor, a device that facilitates this transformation, we were surprised to find that it didn't really have that many parts. To take it apart, all we had to do was flip up two small metal tabs with a screwdriver. When we did this, we could see the main parts of the motor. This is the armature. It's made of copper wires wrapped around thin metal plates. At the top, you can see the commutator rings, which transfer electricity from the brushes to the coils. In the housing of the motor, there are two permanent magnets on either side. In this piece of the motor, you can see the brushes, which transfer the electricity to the commutator rings. So basically, the motor appears pretty simple, but it relies on a complicated part of physics, electromagnetism. To give a simple explanation, magnets have two opposite poles, a north pole and a south pole. These poles have the capability to create a force. They'll attract opposite poles, and they'll repel like ones. For example, if you put the south pole of one magnet near the north pole of another, there will be an attractive force. If you put the north pole of a magnet near the north pole of another, there will be a repulsive force. It's these forces that are the basis of creating the rotation in a motor. So now, let's set up a basic motor. When we took ours apart, we found two oppositely charged magnets fixed like this. Now, the most basic way to explain how a motor works will be with one coil. If we supply a DC current through this coil, the current would flow through like this. There is also a magnetic field present in this direction. We know that in this situation, the wire will experience a force. This is because of one of the laws of electromagnetism, which is the Lorentz law. This law states that when a wire that carries an electric current is placed in a magnetic field, the current will experience the Lorentz force, and this will create a very large force on the wire. We can use Fleming's left-hand rule to determine the direction of this force. Orient your hand like it is in the picture. Point your forefinger in the direction of the magnetic field and your middle finger in the direction of the current. The direction that your thumb is pointing will be the direction of the resulting force. These opposing upward and downward forces create torque, which causes the armature to rotate. When the armature rotates, the commutator rings connect with the power source of opposite polarity, making sure that the torque is always in the same direction and causing continual rotation. To transform this model into a more practical DC motor that might actually be on the market like ours, more coils should be added to increase rotational smoothness. Layers of steel should also be put in between coils to enhance magnetic flux interaction. Our DC motor was made with cost efficiency in mind. This can be seen in some of the materials, such as the case, which is made of a steel alloy. Steel alloys are very cheap to make and very cheap to produce. In terms of making the case better, uh, one possible way is to make it out of aluminum. Aluminum is lighter uh, and just as strong, but it is a lot more expensive, so would therefore raise the price. The cap closes off the motor from the outside environment. It is made of a cheap plastic because that's very inexpensive and very easy uh, to mold into this shape. It has two electrodes to attach wires to and also has a metal ring inside of it so that when the axle is placed through it does not grind down the plastic. The brushes are very cheap and easy uh, to make. They are not very effective though as they wear down very easily as they are very thin and they do not have a spring to push them back onto the motor. On the inside of the case we have permanent rare earth magnets. 
These are used instead of electromagnets because on this scale electromagnets do not work well. On the inside of the motor we have the armature which is located on the axle. Now the axle is made from uh, polished steel. Uh, the reason it's polished is to reduce friction and wear. Also reducing friction and wear are the two plastic washers on the inside. In larger motors these are replaced by ball bearings as the plastic would wear down too fast. Both the wire and the commutator in our device are copper. This is due to co copper being highly conductive and its ability to be put into wire easily. It is not the most inexpensive metal, but it is really the only viable option for such a device. In between the copper electromagnets are steel dividers. These steel dividers are used because they are easily permeated by magnetic fields and do not interfere in the interactions between the copper wiring and the uh, permanent magnets. There are several improvements we can make to our motor that will allow it to run more efficiently. For starters, the more coils that the motor has, the more efficiently it will run. This is because when the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic fluxes here, the coil is too far away from the magnets, so the torque being produced on the coil is almost zero. This causes irregularities in the spinning motion of the motor, and it means that the spinning motion of the motor will slow down as the coils move farther away from the magnets, and then speed up again as they get closer to them, because the torque produced by the magnets is decreasing, as the coils get farther away and then increasing as they come back to the magnets. Adding more coils connected to separate commutator rings will solve this problem. Now, when one of the loops is vertical, another will be connected to the power source, so an electric current will be acting on the motor, causing it to spin at more constant speed. By adding more loops, the motion becomes smoother because the torque rotating the coils becomes more constant. This is because the coils have less distance to travel before the next one reaches the magnet, preventing the rotor from slowing down or speeding up as much. We can also improve the two metal brushes that are located here on our motor. These two metal brushes are used to allow electric current to run from the wires to the commutator rings, which powers the motor. Over time, these brushes will wear out due to friction caused from the rotation of the motor, and lose contact with the commutator rings, which will decrease the current flowing throughout the motor, and eventually the brushes will be too far away for current to travel to the commutator rings at all. To fix this problem, we would put two springs here and here behind the brushes and also make the brushes thicker so that they can make contact with the larger area of the commutator rings. This way that as the brushes wear out, the springs will push the brushes forward so they remain in constant contact with the commutator rings. This will keep the electric current running through the motor constant, preventing it from slowing down or speeding up over time. This is important for motors that have to run continuously for long periods of time. Without the springs, a motor like ours would have to be constantly replaced as its brushes wear out. Another way to improve our motor would be to use an electromagnet instead of the permanent magnet that our motor uses. A series motor has the field coils connected in series to the power source. This means that there is only one path from the power source that flows through the entire circuit. Series motors have fast starting speeds, however they slow down drastically as the load they spin increases and the motor needs to produce more torque to rotate the object. The other kind of motor is a shunt motor, which has, a f which has the field coils connected in parallel. A parallel circuit has two or more paths for the current to flow through. The same voltage runs across the entire circuit, and the sum of the currents flowing through each part of the circuit is the same as the current flowing from the power source. A shunt motor spins slower than a series motor for lighter loads, 
but it's able to spin at an almost constant speed as its load increases and it's needed to provide more torque to rotate the object. So depending on how heavy the load is, a series or a shunt motor can be more efficient. DC motors also produce a back EMF according to Faraday's law. An electromotive force, or EMF, is the potential difference of a system which causes an electric current to be produced. A back EMF creates a current that opposes the current that induces it. Faraday's law states that when a magnetic environment of a metal coil is changed, such as rotating the magnetic field surrounding it, the coil will produce an electromotive force. So when the armature loops of a DC motor are rotated through the magnetic field that powers them, they create an EMF that opposes the input voltage of the motor, known as a back EMF. The total armature current is equal to the input voltage minus the back EMF divided by the resistance of the motor. The back EMF produced is directly proportional to the speed of the motor's rotor. When the motor is first turned on, the speed of the rotor is zero, so no back EMF is produced, which makes the current in the armature equal to the input voltage only. The current produced when the motor is first turned on can be large enough to cause the rotor to burn out, so larger motors need to be able to control the input voltage to prevent the motor from burning out while the back EMF is zero. With our motor, the back EMF must be taken into consideration in order to determine the voltage needed to allow the motor to run at a specific speed.